Now it's time to talk about pipeline table functions, a very special type of table function that has some unique characteristics in the context of the PL SQL language. Let's take a look. Well, let's, as they say, start at the very beginning with the simplest possible table function I can imagine showing to you. First of all, I'll create a nested table type of strings. Then I'll create a function called strings that returns a nested table of that type. And I add the keyword pipeline. So that's the first indication that this is a different kind of function. You, you literally declare it as a pipelined function in the header of that function, whether it's in the package specification and body or as a schema level function as you see here. Then generally speaking, if you've seen from other table function, you declare a local nested table, you fill up that table, you return it. But with the pipeline table function, none of that. You simply say pipe row, you use the pipe row statement you provide the value that you want to pass back, in this case a string, which could be an expression, a literal, a variable, or as we'll see in the next example, an object type being passed back with more complex structure. I use the pipe row statement to pass or pipe that row back to the invoking select statement. And then when I'm all done, I return. And I return nothing but control. I don't return any data. That's already been done with the pipe row statements. I simply return control. Outside of a pipeline table function, the only place you will find a return statement that returns nothing but control is in a procedure. You can actually return from a procedure. Generally speaking, you won't see that, and you don't want to see it because it reflects a usually rather unstructured piece of code. But inside the pipeline table function, it makes perfect sense and is the only kind of return statement you can have. Return back to the call inquiry when I'm all done piping back the data. Let's compile these statements. All fine. Let's try it out. So, select column value from the table clause applied to the strings function. Run my query. ABC. And, as you may have noticed, in 12 to and higher. You don't even need the table clause anymore. Let's get rid of it. Just call the strings function, and the SQL engine knows what to do. ABC. Cool stuff. Well, so far what's cool is that it's really odd looking, right? I use this pipe row statement. I don't declare a local collection. I don't populate the collection. And I simply return control. These are the hallmarks of the pipeline table function. Now let's take a look at some of the consequences of this approach and why you might want to use it. So in terms of looking at a slightly more real-world example, we're going to go back to the old stock split from one stock to two in the ticker table. We'll look at the code differences between a non-pipelined and a pipelined table function in that context. And then we'll run them for a fairly large number of rows so you can see the difference in performance that you can get out of a pipeline table function and also impact on session memory or process global area memory. Okay, so first of all, we'll go ahead and create the stocks table with open and close prices on each row, and then we'll enter 200,000 rows into that table. Okie doke. Next, I'll create the ticker object type that looks just like the ticker table, and the nested table of ticker objects, and then a package stock manager that will declare the ref cursor type that we need to pass in the select from the stocks table into my pipeline and non-pipeline table functions. Run my code. Great. Now let's do a quick review of the non-pipeline traditional table function that we use to double the rows from one in the stock table to two in the ticker table. So I pass in my cursor variable of that ref cursor type, which is my select star from stocks. I'm going to return a nested table of those ticker object types. I declare a local collection to grab the rows from the cursor variable and then process them. And I declare my collection that I'm going to return my nested table to return and I initialize it. Okay, inside a loop, fetch 100 rows at a time, stop when there's nothing left. For each one of the rows in that local collection, I'm going to make room in my doubled array for the new rows. I'm going to construct my ticker object type instance for the open data, and then a second time for the closed data, so that's my one to two split. 
In each case, I then put them into the collection, add them to the end of the collection, and then when I'm done, I close my cursor variable, and I return that collection. So there's my non-pipeline version. Now let's take a look at the pipeline version of the same functionality. So, doubled pipeline. Again, pass in my rows as a cursor variable, return my nested table. I still need my local collection that's going to take the rows out of that cursor variable and then process them because I do want to use bulk processing to fetch, say, 100 rows at a time or 1,000 rows at a time. Start up my loop, fetch up to 100 rows at a time, stop when I'm done. For each one of the rows that I fetch, each one of the stock rows, now I need to break them out from 1 to 2 as before, but it's a pipeline table function. So I'm not going to make room in a local array, fill up that array, and return it. I'm simply going to say, construct the object type instance for the open data and pipe it back. Construct the object type instance for the closed data, pipe it back over and over and over again. Keep sending it back to the call inquiry. And then when I'm done, close that cursor variable and then return control. Don't return any data, just say I'm done and pass control back to the call inquiry. That's a pipeline table function. Before taking a look at the impact of a pipeline versus a non-pipeline function in terms of performance and memory, let's make sure that it actually does its job, which is it takes in a single row of the stocks table and doubles it out to two to match the tickers table. Well, let's see. What have we got in the tickers table right now? Nothing. Let's see if we can insert into the tickers table from the stocks table. 400,000 rows inserted. So we inserted 200,000 rows into the stocks table. We grabbed all those rows, converted it to a cursor variable, passed it into my doubling pipeline function. It did the one to two split, didn't populate a local collection, passed the data set back, piping a row by row, converted into a relational table format, selected all those pseudo ticker rows, inserted them into the tickers table, and we end up with the data we need it. Nice. Now at this point, you'd be totally justified in saying, so what's the difference? You don't see a difference here. And in some cases, you might not see a big difference in performance, though you should always see a pretty big difference in memory consumption. So what we're going to do now is take a closer look on those two issues by analyzing how much time it takes to run the pipeline versus non-pipeline version, and also analyzing the amount of memory consumed by that session under these different scenarios. So what I'm going to do is create a little utilities package. My utils package has an initialize and show results procedures. In the package body, what I'm going to do is calculate the delta in uh, elapsed time and also in amount of memory consumed by running these two different functions. So in terms of calculating memory consumed or process global area consumed, which is the amount of memory per session, what I'm going to do is query from a couple of different V$ sign views. These are the virtual dynamic views that give us information about the database as it's running. You'll have to have select granted onto these views to run the script yourself, though you can see it in action in LifeSQL. So I'm basically going to say, get me the statistic value for session PGA memory. My initialized procedure deletes everything from the tickers table and saves that, displays the context, gets the start time, and gets the start memory utilization. DBMesh utility get time is a utility that you can use to calculate elapsed time down to the hundredth of a second. Nice little feature. So that's initialize. Show results. Well, I'm going to say how many rows did I get from the tickers table, and then I'm going to show that count. And then I will display the difference between the current get time minus the start time, and the difference between the current PGA consumption minus the last PGA consumption, so we'll see the deltas. So I've created my table functions, pipeline and non-pipeline. I've created my utilities package to analyze memory consumption and elapsed time. Now let's give it a run for its money, and I'm going to do it in LiveSQL as a part of the tutorial that you yourself take as part of the class. So I've opened up module four in my tutorial, pipeline table functions. I'll click on impact of switch to pipeline table functions. Now what you'll do, I already did a number of these steps, is simply click on insert into editor, and then you run the code, I'm going to go right down to that utils package, insert into editor, run this code. My package is created, including the package body, then now let's run the test. 
So I'm going to initialize the test, clearing out the table, resetting the memory, the restarting the elapsed time for pipeline. Then I'm going to take all the data from the stocks table, 200,000 rows. I'm going to double it up, pass it back as a set of rows and columns, insert into the tickers table, but I only want the first nine rows retrieved. Okay. And then for non-pipeline, the same thing. Pass in all the rows of the stock table as a cursor variable, double them up, pass them back. Oh, but I just want the first nine. Run my code. And I see some very interesting results. Pipeline. Completed in, whoa, zero hundredths of a second. In less than one hundredth of a second, it got those nine rows and inserted them into the tickers table. Now let's take a look at non-pipeline. 91 hundredths of a second. That's still fast, but it's much slower than the pipeline version. And what you can see here is very clearly that each pipe row is sending the row back to the invoking select statement. That select statement can take advantage of that data and start to use it as part of its processing. And since it has where row num is less than 10, as soon as it got the ninth row back from the pipeline table function, it said, I'm done. And it terminated the execution of the pipeline table function and got right to it inserted those nine rows in less than a hundredth of a second. With a non-pipeline version, it, standard, it followed the standard PL SQL protocol. You call a function, it does all its work, and when it's done and returns data, it also returns control, and then you can keep on going, but in the meantime, your session is blocked. So, in that second example, that insert select, it called the doubled non-pipeline function. It took those 200,000 rows, and it worked really hard, and it produced 400,000 rows and passed them back to the select statement, and the select statement said, oh, thanks, but I just needed the first nine rows. So there you see the impact on performance that you can get with a pipeline table function, and the fact that the select statement can use that data being piped back even before the function is done. Then, let's take a look at memory. First nine rows, ran my code, didn't consume any additional PGA memory over the, additional al the initial allocation, but my non-pipeline version consumed over 96 million bytes of memory for the same operation. And what you're seeing there is the impact of populating a nested table, which we'll go back and take a look at right now. So why does the pipeline table function consume so much less memory than the table function that is not pipelined? Oh, and by the way, this is my puppy Moonbeam. She jumped on my lap for the last recording. It's actually pretty simple. So the, one of the major differences between non-pipelined and pipeline table functions is that with a non-pipeline table function, I have to declare a local collection, fill it up row by row, and then return it when I'm done. And that, so that collection consumes memory inside this block of code and is then passed back to the SQL layer, thereby consuming lots of PGA or the amount of PGA needed to populate that collection. In my case, 400,000 elements in the collection. With the non-pipeline version, conversely, I do not return anything except control. Every time I have a row of data that I want to hand back to the select statement for processing, I pipe it back out. No intermediate data structure, no intermediate collection, no consumption of process global area to do that. And therefore, the profile, the memory profile, for pipeline table functions is usually much, much lower than, than non-pipeline table functions. And there you have it, folks. To work with pipeline table functions, you first add the pipeline keyword to the header of your function, and if it's in a package, it goes in the spec and the body. Second, don't declare a local collection to hold the rows that you're passing back to the invoking query. Instead, simply use the pipe row statement to pass that information directly back to the calling query. And then when you're done, return nothing but control. Don't return any data. The net effect, you will gra drastically reduce the amount of PGA memory consumed to, to work with that table function. And second of all, in a number of uh, circumstances, you will see improved performance of that table function from within the SQL statement.